SJ. Welcome to Muskogee Radio, your weekly source for tribal and community news, interesting guests and discussions, plus a local events calendar. SJ, Stone Go, Gary Five Jaho Jeff Gados, Muskogee Radio, Mabu Hedget Wedgis. Welcome to our program here on this uh, one more uh, beautiful Okmulgee uh, morning here, and uh, it's beginning of fall, change of the seasons and things like that. So we'll see what the crazy Oklahoma weather will have for us in this coming season. Uh, for our listeners, for those of you who've tuned in today, we've got a couple of things we'll be uh, sharing. First of all, uh, we uh, um, got our district court judge, uh, Greg Bigler, to uh, carve out a bit of his schedule for us to come in and kind of give us an idea on how the courts are handling the uh, the changes in uh, occurred uh, after the McGirt decision. And then in the second portion of our program, We'll be speaking with some folks from our Family Violence Prevention Program. October is Domestic Violence Prevention Month, so we'll be speaking with them on how we're doing, uh, what's the future look like, resources available, and things of that nature. But uh, first of all, uh, uh, Judge Bigler, thank you for coming in. We appreciate uh, you making some time for us. Uh, Thank you you very much, and uh, appreciate being here. All right. Well... uh, how do we jump into this? Uh, first of all, I guess, let's uh, go back to the beginning then, the uh, McGirt decision itself. Uh, we won't get into the uh, specific legalities there, but uh, I want to know what uh, what you thought uh, when you heard of the decision being made, and how did it strike you and perhaps your colleagues uh, uh, without getting into you know anything that we shouldn't, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, but uh, you know wow, it, it, it just kind of floored the rest of us. And uh, what did you think? Well, when we were waiting for the decision, uh, we were uh, nervous as to how it would come across, come out. Uh, I think that nobody really had an idea uh, whether we'd win or not. The uh, court was obviously very closely decided and that's why for uh, we suspect that it was held over from the Murphy case the last the term before right, uh, right. after uh, uh, Scalia had passed away there came out and it was just passed to the next term and we suspected that and uh, almost certainly was because there's a 4-4 tie mm-hmm. and then uh, uh, Judge Gorsuch uh, had been on the bench, but uh, they appointed a new judge, but Gorsuch did not uh, participate in that Murphy uh, decision, we suspect, uh, recused himself. Um, and so when it came out, we were very uh, excited that Gorsuch, uh, Justice Gorsuch had written the opinion, um, and I'm sure the people have heard uh, bits and pieces of his uh, uh, from that about uh, recognizing that there was a promise made and that uh, great nations keep their promises. So uh, we weren't surprised. Uh, Gorsuch is a very conservative judge, uh, socially very conservative. But when he was being appointed to, uh, being nominated for the uh, Supreme Court, U.S. United States Supreme Court, many uh, national uh, Indian advocacy organizations supported it. Uh, mm, right. Even though they were, they they might have been generally not favorable for his social stand issues, but when Judge Gorsuch was on the Tenth Circuit Court of Federal Appeals, and the federal system has three levels: it has the uh, trial levels at the district courts. Uh, there, uh, there's a trial, there's a federal district court in Muskogee, and there's one here in Tulsa, and then they go up on appeal to the Tenth Circuit, which is uh, located in uh, from here in Oklahoma. It's located in, in the Denver. And when Judge Gorsuch was on the appeals court in Denver, he issued several Indian law decisions which were very favorable, very well understood, the Mm -hmm. tribal perspective, and recognized treaty rights. And so we were hopeful, Uh, but even we were surprised when it came out so strongly in favor of treaty rights. Uh, That's one of the most strong pro-tribal decisions in many years. So we were very excited about that. 
Now, uh, tribes around the nation have uh, registered their support for you know, the way to, the outcome of this uh, particular case. Um, do you think maybe it was uh, like a landmark or a turning point, uh, as you say, in recognition of tribal sovereignty? Uh, did it underline it, so to speak? Uh, it was for that court. Uh, mm. Of course, we now have potential for a new Supreme Court justice being appointed uh, that's in the uh, uh, discussions uh, to replace uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was the justice that just passed away. And so we don't know how that will impact it, mm, uh, yeah. but the decision was a very strong statement that recognized treaties and agreements with tribes made in the past continue to be valid today. And mm -hmm. that's a very hopeful occurrence. That did not always happen over the past 30, 40 years. Right, yeah, as long as the grass grows. Right, and so I think that's why the tribes around the nation, the United States, were so supportive and so excited about this because although it impacted the reservation of the Muscogee um, Nation, the way that it did so was to f uh, solidly base itself upon the prior agreements with the United States and the tribe, and that is a positive for all Indian nations. Right, I heard they were all uh, you know, raising their arms in happiness and joy that the decision had gone this way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Personally, did you take a deep breath and say, okay, uh, that part's done? Well, we knew that uh, uh, you've always got to be careful what you wish for. And so <laughs> here we are today. You know, it's like you say, you, uh, you say that I can't wait to have a, uh, when you're a parent, proud parent waiting to, for your new baby to be born. And, and all of a sudden, instead of having one baby, you've got triplets or quad, uh, quadruplets. Oh, and all of a sudden, you know three or four times the blessing so right well uh, think of it this way also three or four times the diaper change <laughs> that's correct it's a it is a lot more work but that's what we asked for and we're very very excited about those possibilities all right now for our listeners who uh, may not be familiar with the McGirt case and, and what it uh, essentially decided can uh, you perhaps cap capsulize that decision, kind of give us a real okay. small idea of what, what it was all about? Yes, and I think that there's two cases which uh, flowed together because originally it went up as uh, Mr. Murphy's case. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the one I mentioned earlier, which there was a tie, we believe, and so it wasn't decided. Uh, Mr. McGirt's case, uh, the Murphy case came out of the federal courts in a process of uh, appeal. The McGirt's case came from the Oklahoma Supreme Court, and uh, they both involved the same issue, under fundamental issue of whether or not the reservation existed. They were, uh, and it's very important to remember that the uh, allegations in each instance were very uh, heinous crimes by the uh, 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 defendant. Right. And so we don't want to ever forget that's what uh, what led to this. In Mr. Murphy's case, it was whether, and in Mr. McGirt's case, the question is, they were citizens of a tribal nation, and the uh, uh, crime occurred within what was the reservation boundaries, uh, the state of Oklahoma and the United States at one point, claimed it was the former reservation boundaries, mm -hmm. and the nation and Mr. McGirt and Mr. Murphy claimed it was the continuing reservation boundaries. If the reservation continued to exist, if it occurred on what we call fee land, in other words, lands owned by non-Indians, then with a reservation, the, either only the federal court or the tribal court would have jurisdiction over a tribal citizen for a crime committed. So in other words, uh, there's different types of lands, it gets a little bit technical, but if the tribe owns a land or an individual owns a land and it's held for them because of their status as an Indian, it's what we call Indian country. If the reservation is disestablished, then it's only lands directly held by those two, by a tribe or the Indian. But if a reservation exists, all lands within it are tribal lands for jurisdictional purposes. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if without a reservation, I'd have to basically commit a crime on an allotment or the tribal complex to be prosecuted by the feds or by the tribe. If a reservation exists, if I'm here at downtown of Mogin and, uh, or at Walmart or on the highway, 
if the res it's within the reservation, then the feds or the tribe prosecutes, not the state. And so that was the basic issue. What it, it continued to exist from those agreements and did the allotment agreement from 1906, 1898, those agreements back then, did they disestablish the reservation or did it continue to ex exist? Mm. Now, we, uh, that's, uh, I guess, primarily the issue we're hearing in today's news where um, uh, some inmates who have been convicted of crimes in the past are saying, well, this was illegal now, you have to do it all over. I need to go to a federal court. Uh, we're hearing about arrests even you know, in, the, in the last couple of days where uh, a suspect or someone like that was saying that uh, you know, I'm a tribal citizen and therefore you have no jurisdiction. This is the essence of the issue. Uh, I think that with the uh, number of cross-deputy agreements, in other words, agreements mm. between the tribe and the state and the local authorities and the federal, there's also some uh, federal cross uh, special commission cards issued. Generally, the law enforcement officers have authority to do an arrest. It's only a question of where it gets prosecuted. So they have to establish whether they're tribal citizens or not and where it occurred and let the attorneys sort it out. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of those will be in tribal court, some will be in federal court, and of course if they don't meet the criteria, they would still be in the state court. Right now, in a uh, uh, roundtable discussion some weeks back, we heard uh, law enforcement and uh, the United States DA saying that uh, uh, this decision is not a get out of jail card. It is uh, a way of sorting out the legal paths that these uh, cases would have to follow, right? Yeah, I think that's probably a, a Unless you want to go into uh, a full semester law school course, <laughs> that's probably as good an answer as any. Okay, well, yeah, I probably wouldn't make that one. <laughs> now, uh, um, how about uh, its impact now? We're seeing uh, uh, systems and codes being worked out. Uh, they're telling us that uh, law enforcement officers have been trained and to include this uh, segment in their interrogations. Um, that's, uh, I guess, not perfect yet, but it's still being worked out. So uh, what has been the impact now to uh, our own tribal court, uh, district, uh, district court? Uh, uh, does it, has it swamped your docket? Uh, is it uh, pretty intimidating? We've had a significant increase in our caseloads um, mm -hmm. over the past 10 weeks. Um, for instance, from uh, uh, first of the year, until uh, say the week after, the week of McGirt decision, we had about 16 felony cases filed. Mm -hmm. 16 felony uh, cases. That's not, a case may have more than one charge in them. In other words, if you're, if you're uh, accused of uh, uh, beating up somebody and possessing narcotics, it might be one case filed, but there'd be two charges. Mm -hmm. So we had some 16 felony cases filed in that uh, seven months. And since then, we've had some two, almost 240 total. Oh, my gosh. Now, uh, as you kind of alluded to, a, f a, a goodly number of those are cases which occurred prior to the McGirt decision. So they're not all just cases which have happened since then. And so we probably will continue to see uh, a rise in cases for a while, whether it's three months or six months. But then at some point that will level off and it will uh, slow down a little bit. I mean, it'll be still significantly over what we had prior, but it will be uh, uh, a little bit less than what we are seeing now at least. But I think that the biggest impact really is that, um, I'm, I was trying to think of how you might analogize to it. It's kind of like trying to get ready for a uh, big dinner or feast or whatever else. And so you have to gather up at this point, you're having to try to gather all the foods, and you have to make sure you got the cooks, and you got the utensils, and the menu laid out. And that's where we are at this point. We haven't laid the table to start eating yet. And so uh, we've got these cases which are being investigated, which are being sent to our uh, Creek Nation uh, Attorney Generals, and which are being filed into our court. And so that load at this point is really falling, to be honest, a lot upon my clerks with these new cases rolling in. And we have four, I have four uh, very dedicated, uh, hardworking clerks there at the district court right now. And we're going to need some more clerks. We're going to need them very, very uh, quickly. 
And in fact, uh, we are trying to advertise and get that out. So if, if people are looking for those positions, you know, contact our employment training, human resources, and put in mm -hmm. applications. We're always looking for that. And so there will be a caseload. But again, those are at the very first stages. So right, really, as far as criminal matters, what we've had is what we call the initial hearing, where we bring them in, inform them of the charges, make sure they understand they have the right to attorney, and set it for a later date for the next step in the process. And so we haven't got to hearings, we haven't got to trials, we haven't got to motions, we are, certainly aren't at the jury stage. So that's three, six months off. It's like everything else, it's just kind of rolling down. So I think that it's all manageable. Uh, it's going to be manageable. We will have to ramp up. Uh, we're going to need, uh, and I hopefully will be meeting with our facilities and uh, other people here very quickly. I've been informed, we have been looking at trying to get a new court building for several years. That's in the master plan. I think that what I've been told is that's moving very quickly to the top of the, of the, uh, uh, of the list for the needs for the master plan. Because obviously if we have, every day now, we have um, anywhere from five to ten uh, defendants coming into the court uh, for arraignments. That's just for criminals. Mm -hmm. uh, we also are seeing an increase in protective orders. Uh, we have not yet seen the uh, significant, we've seen increases, but not the huge significant increases in the juvenile matters, say, deprived and neglected cases, in part because they have reached agreements with the state to continue on at least temporarily with some of those cases as we get them transferred over. But that means we're going to have to have more uh, attorneys representing those individuals. We're going to have to have more uh, clerks to file the cases. We're going to have to have more space for hearings. And we're going to have to really be uh, cognizant of safety issues. Uh, right now, obviously, we're there with the Supreme Court and with the district, uh, with the uh, uh, National Council. And so, to be honest, one of my really huge concerns is because while all this is going on, we also have to worry about COVID yeah. and coronavirus. And at this point, we're having to transport those uh, anywhere from three or four, sometimes just one or two. But in the past couple of days, we've had eight to ten. Uh, defendants transferred from Tulsa County, uh, to David L. Moss uh, detention facility, down to Okmulgee to our court for their initial appearance and a reading of rights and assignment to a case later on, and then in our courtroom, and then transferred back up to David L. Moss. And so every day, our light horse is transferring, transporting three to ten people in a small enclosed vehicle, and they're in our courtroom. And that makes me very nervous about mm -hmm. that with uh, COVID. We are doing things that we're trying to. We got some CARES monies that we're trying to, uh, that we've actually uh, got a, uh, in the next week or two, we're hoping we'll increase our video cyber uh, remote capabilities. We're doing a lot of our hearings remotely. We want our uh, people who are in court for cases to check with the clerks because we really want to keep them out of the court if we can for their own health purposes and ours. If our attorneys go get COVID and disappear, if our clerks have to take quarantine, if the judges have to quarantine, this whole thing can grind to a halt. And of course, we are very concerned about the light horses uh, safety and the issues in those transport. So it's, it's a lot of moving parts all at once. We have, I was thinking that uh, we probably have six or seven number one priorities right now. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to take care of each of those. But it's a uh, it is exciting. I think it's well within our the nation's capabilities, um, but there is definitely a lot more work for everybody. Well, let me ask you about that work. Uh, a lot more work. Uh, uh, with all these factors taken into consideration, and uh, uh, how many cases have you gotten through that system since this decision? You mean all the way concluded? Yeah. yeah. We've had, uh, at this point, we haven't had trials on them because okay. it's all, because, uh, uh, as I was told by a law professor my first semester many, many years ago, uh, he and this was not in relation to tribal courts or federal courts, anything else, he just said that the wheels of justice grind very slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. Mm -hmm. So things move slowly through the court systems. For instance, Mr. Murphy and Mr. McGirt's cases, uh, which were decided in the past year, started in 2005, I think. So you can see that that's the federal system, the state system. But it can take a while. Uh, but we've had some people who've pled out, uh, and so they, those, those cases have moved forward. I don't know how many have been concluded. 
Uh, we have set quite a few for the next phase here in coming December and January, and we'll see what happens at that point. Uh, a lot of cases are uh, reached by plea agreement. In other words, that the defendant decides that they're going to take an offer from the attorney generals and that it's reached that way. Um, but uh, not all of them. So we will see. And then, of course, that's complicated by, again, as I mentioned, the coronavirus, is that we have concerns about the health and safety of our uh, jury pool. A lot of our jurors are, I won't say elderly, we excuse elderly if they wish, mm -hmm. but even if you're in their 50s, uh, health issues, there's concerns. How do you get uh, six jurors in a room and socially distanced for a period of time t to conclude a trial? And so those are things that we're still working out, and so we had uh, actually pushed our jury term from uh, March till this fall, and we're now pushing that again off. Uh, that has happened generally. Uh, nationwide in all levels of government. Well, uh, let me uh, jump in there and ask you this, uh, something that popped into my mind. Was, uh, you mentioned the safety precautions. So are we seeing uh, uh, people coming into your courtroom wearing masks and doing the social distance thing? We absolutely require it. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, we did that back, uh, we issued that order, I issued an administrative order back in uh, probably about spring break time in March mm -hmm. when it started to appear that this was really ramping up. And we have been very aggressive about it. Uh, we make sure that all the defendants have it. Uh, if it slips down over their nose, I uh, remind them. Uh, we do not want them to get sick. We don't want them to get somebody else sick. We don't want to get sick. Mm -hmm. And so we know that it is not a cure-all, but if it increases our if it uh, helps us 25 percent, we'll take that. Right. Uh, we have also, for instance, in the courtroom and throughout our clerk's office, uh, placed uh, these little air filtration units, the home units, mm -hmm. the HEPA filters. Again, maybe it makes 5 percent, 10 percent difference, we'll take it. Uh, we have inc we uh, had got uh, our uh, tribal construction and we got CARES money and we put the uh, high uh, efficiency HEPA filters in the uh, HVAC systems. We've increased the in intake of outside air, and we do require we have at the everybody that comes in the building has to have their temperature taken, and answer a series of questions as to their uh, um, have they been around any coughs, sicknesses, anything like that. Right. So we try very. We're doing what we can, but we know it's not perfect, mm -hmm. and th th and that's what we are always thinking about. With this uh, additional responsibilities there. Um, What's it done to the uh, the time it uh, might take for a case to, to appear before you and then your process? Has it slowed you down significantly? Um, I'm not sure if it's slowed us down significantly yet. Uh, I think that we are moving it. We are increasing a lot more cases instead of maybe having three or four initials and having one uh, or two large uh, status dockets, disposition dockets per month, we're having those uh, at least once a week. And so we'll have a full afternoon of video and cyber matters. Now, it does take a little bit longer because we are really trying to get people to appear by telephone or by video mm -hmm. uh, and we're using that method because it keeps everybody a little bit distance, there's less contact, we're hopefully keeping it a little bit safer that way. And so there are issues because obviously uh, there are people in rural areas who are not as connected through high-speed internet. Uh, that makes some difficulties. Uh, we've been pretty fortunate on having people come calling in. We've been trying to be understanding of that. Uh, and of course it takes longer to do that when you don't have, say, 15 defendants and attorneys present in the courtroom that you can just call one after another, you yeah. know, A, B, C, D. Instead, you have to say, have them call in onto the Zoom or go to meeting or Blue Jeans, whatever the, the uh, uh, software happens to be. See if they're there, get the connections worked out, see that that's perhaps the wrong one, get somebody else online, find out where they are. So that takes longer that way. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we've got more cases, so we're pushing them out a little bit. We're going to have to uh, get all these attorneys worked out and signed up. So it is taking a little bit longer, but at this point, I'm not sure if it's taking, it's not like six months or a year or anything like that at this point, right. but we will see what happens as we go forward. Well, I can sympathize with those folks who are having difficulties with uh, teleconferencing. I mean, our, our own staff does our editorial sessions by Zoom, 
and that can be real frustrating yes. too, when, you, when you've got the gear. Would something like a satellite station, say in Okima or somewhere else, uh, be a, a, of use to you? That probably, something like that would be good. I know that when I've worked for other tribes in the past, uh, and this was long before anything like, you mm -hmm. know, these epidemics came through, some of the places uh, had, had uh, substations. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, we had talked, and I hadn't heard the, uh, anything in the past two weeks. That's another thing I need to, uh, that we're working on, uh, is that is there a way that we could have the uh, remote location in Tulsa for these defendants from David L. Moss to appear? We had thought we were all but ready to have a uh, portable computer and Wi-Fi hotspot placed into David L. Moss on a Thursday afternoon, and my, one of my, my uh, uh, employees was ready to run it over there momentarily when he got the call that, uh, no, we can't do that unless we get a new contract for having an employee to do it. And that has mm -hmm. been a month since then. Uh, there has been, uh, we were very hopeful that that would, and we we're very excited about that, and that has just fallen apart. Mm -hmm. So whether we can find a satellite office, obviously it's, you know, you'd say, well, why, why not, don't you use the River Spirit facility or the um, uh, River Walk? Mm -hmm. Well, we're not going to endanger the public that way, obviously. And so we need to find a secure facility that's close, that's transportable, or alternatives, you know, uh, of course, the, the the best thing would be if we could do it directly through the uh, the jail facilities itself. And that's, we've been very fortunate. Oak, Oak Fusky's been very cooperative. We had things working well with Oak Mulgee, but now that has been pulled out. So, uh, and I think that uh, Creek County is doing the same, but we, we really need that. And we're looking at what possibilities for having remote locations over at Muskogee also. Right, it seemed like uh, if you could get worked out, it would solve a lot of problems there. Now, um, with this uh, decision being made and uh, uh, kind of a uh, system being put together, a protocol, uh, is uh, there a lot of information available, uh, I mean, from the court in particular to begin with? And then since uh, this uh, decision's been made, uh, is there uh, um, thoughts in mind, a procedure perhaps for public access filing for information? Uh, we have uh, we have a, a court software management system that we're using and that we have been trying to get that uh, up there and going. I think that some of that is accessible now. We have, uh, I think it was about in the past year that we had it set up so that the people can make payments online and filing fees online, I think. So that we think that that's going to add a lot and we've been very uh, exploring those options. Mm -hmm. All right, now, um, I attended the, uh, as I said earlier, the uh, conference between law enforcement and, and, you know, Fed, State, Tulsa, and our own, and uh, they were talking about, uh, uh, you know, the challenges being there, and some people might not understand what uh, this decision does. So have you run into that problem? Are people coming, being sent to you now? who really don't know what's going on and how to handle it, or are they pretty well prepared when they come in the door? Well, at this point, it's been mostly the criminal matters that come into right. our court. Mm -hmm. And so those arrive by uh, filings of the prosecu the, uh, tribal, the Creek Nation Attorney General's Office. And so I think they've been handling a pretty good, uh, uh, handling it pretty well. They obviously have a huge amount of work that they have to go through. And I think that there are still, like anything, when it's a transition that they are working out with the other entities, uh, state agencies and federal agencies. But uh, we'll see how that goes in the future. Um, I, I think that they've got a lot that they're on their plate, and they seem to be doing a, uh, a, a pretty good job so far with this. Mm -hmm. As the... Uh, uh Timeline progresses. We're we're going to be uh, looking at a, a larger caseload. Do you think? Or uh, oh yes, um, I think that we'll continue to have more filings as we go forward. Uh, we had done some very rough projections into the future as to what it meant uh, when McGirt M Murphy was first originating from our within internal at the district court, and the when it first came up. And it continues to be that some of the state 
uh, officials are still trying to say that this is like a uh, disaster waiting to happen and mm -hmm. the, the very they have seen to be throwing a lot of roadblocks up but when we looked at it on the numbers we thought it was manageable it was a significant increase but it was not going to be tens of thousands of cases mm -hmm. in other words uh, and it's very very rough estimates from the numbers we could pull say if there was a thousand cases filed in Tulsa and Wagner and Creek County for a particular year for uh, felonies we know that only 10% of that population is native. So roughly 1,000, so maybe 100 of those particular cases, or maybe it's, you know, whatever it happens to be, right? So it's not thousands and thousands. Right, we no. suspect it's much more manageable. It's a significant increase. No tsunami, no No tidal. tsunami. Uh, it is certainly a lot more than we had before, but it's all manageable. We have some of the uh, I am very privileged to be on the court with uh, Judge Prescott and Judge Leeds, and there's uh, Judge Leeds is a former dean of University of Arkansas Law School. J uh, Judge Prescott's done a lot of trials and advocacy. So we're very fortunate. Uh, my staff is very good. Uh, I think the clerks there are as fine as any, as any clerks of any of the state or federal systems. Uh, we do need looking for a couple more bailiffs and probation officers, so if people have a CLEAT certification and they're looking for a new adventure, Mm -hmm. uh, we would welcome them through uh, human resources. And uh, it's a lot more work. It's very exciting. But I think that as with all the things for the nation, people forget that we have been around for a lot of years. We did this in the 1860s and 70s and 80s, back before statehood. We can do it again if we're given mm -hmm. the chance. And now, uh, in the last minute or two we've got here, uh, is there a final thought you might want to leave with our listeners about how the court is uh, handling this uh, brand new responsibility and uh, what physically to perhaps expect? I think it's a uh, exciting time for the nation uh, and for our uh, people, citizens, and for citizens of other tribes. We have a system of laws and codes which are similar to what the state and federal government has. But we are still a tribal nation. We're still Indians. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we will be more aware of that. We want to protect our public. We want to make sure that our community is healthy. And we take these duties very seriously. So I think that uh, uh, we're hopeful. Uh, and I think it will be good for our citizenship and the nation as we move forward. Judge Bigler, thank you so much for making time for us today. You know, I know this is still the ground floor of uh, this new era that we're in, and uh, we hope to call on you again in the future uh, as things progress or digress, <laughs> if, if you will, and uh, keep our, our, uh, our folks uh, uh, updated on what's going on. So, Mado, San Lagasada. Okay. Judge Greg Bigler of the uh, Muscogee Creek Nation District Court. And we're going to take a short pause here, and then we're going to have a crew in here to talk about uh, Domestic Violence Month nationally and here within the Muscogee Creek Nation. So please stay with us. Uh, we'll be back in a short bit. Who am I? Am I Indian? Just because I'm a girl from the res, don't make things up about me. What if I move away? Then who am I? Some kids try meth just to escape, but then I think about my grandma, my little brother, my beadwork, my poetry, and I think, I like who I am, and I know meth is not for me. Check out NCAI.org, a message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Hear that? That's the sound of hope being killed by meth. Methamphetamine use is causing huge problems in our community. Hear that? That's the sound of something you can do about it. Events like rodeo, res ball, and family time can help keep kids away from meth. Talk to your kids. Keep our culture alive. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Learn more at ncai.org. Welcome back to Muskogee Radio here on The Brew, um, beautiful downtown Omogi. Uh, Gary Fife, Joe with Jeff Giddos, and joining us today is I'm going to let them introduce themselves, uh, their names and titles real quick.
Yeah, you can use headphones if you like. If you don't want to, that's all right, too. I'd not. <laughs> okay, just don't put them near the microphone or we'll get a nasty okay. squeal. Okay. Just, um, good morning. Uh, my name is Leisha Deer Yargi. I'm a victim advocate for the Muskogee Creek Nation Family Violence Prevention Program. And uh, you've got a couple of folks with us. Uh, will they be joining our discussion? Um, well, they're here for moral support. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right, we've got your own cheering section. Then, huh? um, we have uh, Domestic Violence Month uh, being observed around the nation, and uh, we're interested in finding out how the Creek Nation is dealing with it, uh, the, the issue, and perhaps uh, what you think of the, the uh, national observance. Uh, so perhaps uh, maybe we want to start off kind of getting a, a handle on the... Uh, situation within here in the Muscogee Creek Nation. For the past couple of years when we've had this discussion, we've uh, been some, you know, somewhat encouraged by what we hear of people paying attention. Uh, perhaps not a huge fluctuation in numbers, but uh, nothing that's really digressing and, and is catastrophic or anything. So Alicia, if you were going to describe how the Muscogee Creek Nation situation is right now, uh, do you have some feels on ballpark uh, estimate uh, or just from what you've observed? Uh, well, there's been a slight increase on some of our calls uh, since the COVID and the, um, the um, Supreme Court ruling. So we've had slight increase on our calls. Um, why do you think that's happening? Because people are at, at home more and having to put up, put up with each other a lot more in a domestic situation? Probably some of that and um, maybe, you know, with the domestic violence, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. c comes in different times. I mean, just, I don't think it's so much that everybody's at home, but maybe that there's different times of the year mm -hmm. that situations you know escalate all right and um, what parts of the year might that be um, I guess statistically they say um, there's an increase during holidays uh, mm -hmm. yeah those are uh, highly emotional periods and I guess people would be able to or might react in an extreme fashion perhaps like uh, Christmas and they're feeling down or you know somebody doesn't like somebody coming over or alcohol getting in the way and things like that. Uh, we uh, have um, been, you know, uh, pretty much a strong advocate for support for your program there. Now, how, uh, how would you say that the uh, national observance of uh, Domestic Violence Month uh, uh, helps you? hinders you, it underlines the, the topic, or perhaps puts a spotlight on it. Uh, what are your, your thoughts there? I think nationally, just bringing awareness to domestic violence, mm -hmm. um, having people share that conversation that's mm -hmm. not usually out there. Um, and for the, you know, as for our tribal program, we try to, you know, educate law enforcement some of the community agencies that we work with on some of the um, misunderstandings about domestic violence mm -hmm. and just bringing that awareness throughout the communities. And I think with the, um, the national level, I guess. Well, we partner, um, there is the Native of Violet. Um, uh, why, why don't you identify yourself real quick for me? I'm Crystal Polk, right. and I'm also an advocate with Muskogee Creek Nation Family Violence Prevention Program. Right. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you You're making welcome. time for us. Now, as I say, uh, we, you mentioned a couple of things uh, in a, an educational process for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, what is it, perhaps, that you might uh, want these officers to be aware of when they go to investigate a call on domestic violence? Uh, are there signs they should be looking for, or how would they recognize it, perhaps? Well, you we do offer training um, regarding the lethality assessment that is a state mandate for law enforcement. Um, 
just uh, we have some trainings for um, investigation and um, strangulation protocols. Um, if there was uh, 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 perhaps an, an average call, if there is such a thing, uh, on a, a domestic violence call, uh, what kinds of things usually pop up uh, for the majority of them, perhaps? Are there characteristics, uh, physical traits on uh, somebody's body or somebody you know, crying hysterically in the corner? I mean, what, uh, what signs, I think? I think majority of calls we receive include strangulation, and that's hard to, uh, you know, there's, it's the evidence is hardly there. Only when the victim is um, explaining what happened to her or him, and we do offer uh, domestic violence exams at the um, with our nurses at the Okima and uh, Otmogi Hospital, so they can go in and have some specific. Um, how would you say medical treatment for uh -huh, some of those right. to discuss some of that for the victim and um, and that's what you know part of the training is involved with law enforcement so uh, you know, obvious signs would probably include like a, a, a black eye or bleeding uh, or someone's face being battered or bruises on their arms and as you say strangulation marks so those would be the kinds of things that would jump out at you readily I mean, you'd see that right off the bat, or is it more subtle than that? I think so. With law enforcement, that's probably since they're the you know mm -hmm. first on call. Yeah. That's what they would see. We d we don't go out on calls, but you know, law enforcement would uh, note all that in their reports, and um, then we get we get the calls afterwards and discuss some of the with the victim and mm -hmm. the services that we offer um, going well, into our program. Uh, let me. Uh, uh, jump in right quick before we do this now what would be the procedure then uh, somebody gets uh, puts a call into light horse they send units out to respond um, the uh, situation is uh, analyzed on the spot and then they might make a call to, to your office for as, as an additional resource is that kind of how it goes yes We'll get the we'll get calls because uh, we have a 24-hour mm -hmm. hotline, and so the law enforcement.